Good evening again, and thank you for joining me for our chapter book story time here at the Caribou Public Library. I'm Miss Erin, and we are going to continue with reading The Saturdays by Elizabeth Enright, and we are on chapter five. So if you remember last chapter, um, we had Mona who went to the, the salon, and she got her hair cut and styled, and she did some um, manicures, and then she had to deal with the reactions of her family and... Um, that kind of thing when she got home with the changes in her appearance. Anyway, so we're on to Saturday 5. I wonder who Saturday it is today and what they will be doing. All right, so Saturday 5. After a while, very slowly, it began to be spring. There were rust-colored buds on the ailanthus trees, and one day Mona heard a blue jay in the backyard sounding country countrified and out of place. Pretty soon, it would be time to go to the valley, back to the rambling old wooden house that the Melendies rented every summer. Mona was homesick thinking about it and got all her summer clothes out of their boxes to see if she had outgrown them, which she had, and Randy was glad because now they would descend to her and forgot to put them away again until Cuffy got after her. Rush took his baseball bat to school and Randy wrote a poem. Oliver spent hours in the backyard digging fortifications in the mud. The seats and knees of his overalls were a constant source of, dis of despair for Cuffy. The Independent Saturday Afternoon Adventure Club had so far been entirely successful. Randy had spent her second Saturday at the ballet theater and was now able to walk on her toes quite easily and had made a ballet skirt out of five pairs of muslin curtains that couldn't be darned anymore. Rush had gone to hear Rudolf Serkin play the piano and had been practicing furiously ever since in the hours that were not occupied by school or baseball. Mona had seen Catherine Cornell in a play and was very hard to live with as a result. She now moved queen-like and distant through a world of her own. But this particular Saturday was Oliver's and they had agreed to stay home. Not that he could go out by himself, of course, as they could, but in order to make him feel like a proper member of the Isaac, I-S-A-A-C, they, represent, they respected his Saturday and stayed at home. Also, besides giving him back the three dimes he had lent them, each added a dime of his own. That'll be almost half what we have to spend on our Saturdays, and it will look like a million dollars to him, Rush said. It was his idea. The day passed pleasantly enough. There was lemon pie for dessert at lunch, <coughs> Excuse me. and afterward, Rush and Randy gave Isaac a bath in the basement wash tub. He was philosophical about this ordeal by now and stood passive, though loathing every minute of it. When he was dry, they took him for a walk to show him off. Mona didn't want to go because she had borrowed some of Cuffy's big steel hairpins and was doing her hair in a pompadour just for an experiment. The walk was a great success, and so was Isaac. People stopped them frequently to admire and pat him, and every time they asked what kind of dog he was, Rush gave them a different answer in a polite, serious voice. A Bronx Beagle, he might say, or a Central Park Setter, or an Interborough Rapid Transit Retriever. Randy almost died. When they came back to their own block, they could see Mona hanging out of the second story window of their house. Where's Oliver? She called when they drew near. Rush and Randy looked at her blankly. I don't know. Where is he? shouted Rush. Isn't he a home? cried Randy. We can't find him any place, answered Mona, without withdrawing her head and closing the window in a bang. They ran up the steps and into the house. Cuffy looked pale and distracted. Rush, you go down the street to the Potters and see if by any chance he's gone to play with Petey, though goodness knows he's never done such a thing before. Randy, you run around the block. Maybe he's trying out his roller skates again. Maybe he's just hiding, suggested Randy. His coat and cap are gone, Mona told her. And anyway, I've looked everywhere, in all the closets and underneath the beds, even in the trunks in the basement. Where's father? Gone to Philadelphia to lecture. He won't be back until five and we don't know where to get him or how, how to get him. Hurry up, Randy, run along. At that moment, the object of all this concern was seated comfortably at Madison Square Garden. His knees were crossed. He was leaning back with a bottle of pop in one hand and was watching a lady in spangles hanging by her teeth to a rope 50 feet above the ground. It had been all very simple, but it was also well thought out, a well thought out campaign. For weeks, Oliver had received seven dimes, which he had prudently concealed in one of his last summer's sandals. 
Today he had received seven more, which together with the sandal money made 14 dimes. Untold wealth, but he did not let it go to his head. Everything proceeded according to plan. Today, when he was supposed to be resting, he had got up, put on his coat and cap, and walked faintly jingling right out of the house. There was no kind, there was no trouble of any kind. Then when he got to Fifth Avenue, he went up to a policeman and said, where is the circus, please? And the policeman said, Madison Square Garden, aren't you kind of young to be out alone? Oliver simply said, no, I don't think so, and went on his way. When he came to another policeman some blocks further on, he went up to him and said, where is Mer Madison Square Garden, please? Go into the circus, eh, said the policeman. It's at 50th and 8th Avenue. You all alone? Oliver simply said, yes, I am, and proceeded on his way, leaving the policeman with his hands full of traffic. At 50th Street, he went up to another policeman and said, which way is 8th Avenue, please? That way, said the policeman, jerking a white cotton thumb westward. About three blocks over. Ain't anybody with you? Oliver simply said, no, nobody, and crossed the street with the red light. It was easy when he got there too. He just stood in a long line of grown-ups and children and held tight to his dimes and listened to what the people in front of him said when they got to the window. So when he got there, he was able to say, one please, the kind that costs one dollar and count out 10 dimes slowly and carefully. The man behind the window had to peer down in order to see him at all. Then holding his ticket tightly, he followed close behind a large family and tried hard to look like one of them. Like to hold your own ticket, eh, Sonny? Said the ticket man. Yes, I do, replied Oliver and entered the magic portals. It was wonderful. It smelled of ele elephants the minute you got in, even before you came to the real circus part. Breathing the smell deeply, Oliver climbed some steps that a uniformed man told him to, and then walked along a corridor that another uniformed man told him to. He thought he heard a lion roar someplace and his feet crunched on peanut shells. It was very exciting. Finally, he came to the right door, entered it, and found himself in another world. It was a vast world carpeted with blue sawdust and walled with thousands of faces. A complicated web of cables and rope ladders and nets rose from the huge arena to misty regions high overhead. On the blue sawdust at the bottom, there were three large caged rings, and in each of these rings, the most extraordinary things were happening. This way, bud, said the usher, steering the bedazzled Oliver to a seat. Oliver sat down without knowing that he did so. After a long time, he removed his coat and cap blindly, never taking his eyes off the ring nearest him. In it, three lions, two bears, and a black leopard were climbing ladders while on high gold stools, several seven other lions sat and snarled and batted their, with their paws at their trainer, who was the bravest man in the world, and wore a red coat. He could make those animals do anything. Before he was through, one of the bears was pushing the other in a huge baby carriage while all the lions, on a bridge overhead, sat up on their hind legs and begged. Oliver sighed deeply. It was almost too much. His only regret was that he was too busy watching his ring to pay attention to the others. The air rang with the crack of whips and the sharp commands of the trainers. As the cages were dismantled and the animals taken away, Oliver began to notice the men who were going up and down the aisles selling things. Jeweled canes, clown hats, and things to eat. They called their wares hoarsely like a lot of crows. Hot dogs, hot dogs, cried one, and get your roasted peanuts here, cried another, and ice cold pop, still another. But the one Oliver was most interested in was the man who kept saying, cotton candy, cotton candy, as he went by with what looked like a lot of pink bird's nest on sticks. Oliver finally bought one. It was interesting. You bit into a cloud of pink spun sugar and it instantly became nothing in your mouth. He ate it lingeringly to make it last. All the time, fascinating things were going on in the huge arena before him. Clowns came out and did their stunts. A man jumped over three elephants Ladies in spangles rode standing up on the backs of broad white horses, and dozens of tiny taffy-colored ponies with plumes on their foreheads, like the frills on lamb chops, pranced delicately about the rings and performed the most astonishing tricks. Oliver bit into his pink cloud and stared dreamily. I want some of that candy, said a sharp little voice at, at his side. Oliver turned and start a startled glance on the occupant of the next seat. 
He had forgotten that there was anyone else in the world besides, besides himself and the circus people. Don't bother the little boy, Marlene, said the little girl's mother to, in the kind of weak, uncertain way that no self-respecting child ever pays attention to. I want some, repeated Marlene through her nose. She meant business. She was a very little girl, and she had a pointed chin, dark eyes, black curls as stiff as cigars, and blue hair ribbons, a gold ring, and pink stuff on her tiny fingernails. Oliver detested her. She looked coldly, he looked coldly away and went on eating his candy. Now, Marlene, said her mother, I want some. I want some of that boy's candy. <sighs> I'll let you get some when the man comes by. Now you be a good girl and look at the pretty horsies. I want some of his. You give me that candy, boy. Oliver swallowed the last of it at a gulp, and Marlene uttered a piercing scream of frustration. <gasps> Heads in the row turned and looked at them. Now, Marlene, now, Marlene, said her mother helplessly. But Marlene continued to scream like a steam whistle until her mother had consoled her by buying her a cotton candy stick of her own and a fancy cane besides. Even then, she stared unblinkingly at Oliver. She could not be persuaded to look at the arena, and after a while, the consciousness of that baleful scrutiny spoiled even Oliver's enjoyment. He couldn't pay proper attention to the jugglers. A few rows away on the aisle, he noticed a vacant seat, and after some deliber deliberation, that means thinking about it, considering it, made his way to it without a backward glance at Marlene. After this unpleasant episode, the performance progressed blissfully, without a flaw. The procession was magnificent beyond description, from zebra-drawn coaches to elephants wearing tasseled capes and jeweled howdahs. Oliver watched it raptly while eating a hot dog with mustard. He surveyed the acrobats, whose muscles seemed to stretch like garters, while eating another hot dog, this time with sauerkraut. It was forbidden paradise. Cuffy didn't believe in hot dogs or mustard or sauerkraut. But Oliver believed in them all. By the time the aerial artists had come along, he was quenching a violent thirst with a bottle of pop. It was at this moment that his entire family was in an uproar about his disappearance. The act was so exciting that he couldn't finish the pop until it was all over, because it made his stomach feel so queer when one of the glittering creatures high overhead leapt from her fragile swing and arched through the air like a bird to the next glittering creature. The climax came when one of the creatures stood on her head on a trapeze without holding on and swung to and fro, shimmering like a dragonfly far above the arena. It was breathtaking. Oliver felt so weak after watching her that he quickly finished his pop and purchased a bag of peanuts to fortify himself. Here he is sitting in his seat right here, drinking his pop and watching the trapeze artists swinging. <laughs> Ah, let's see, where would I? What a circus it was! On continual blaze of glory from beginning to end, from the flashing, bounding acrobats to the trained seals clapping their flippers, from the daring tightrope walkers to the fat clown who kept finding live ducklings in his pockets. Oliver did not want to believe it was over and sat for quite a while with people climbing over him and pushing past him in the hope that they were all mistaken and that something new was about to begin in the arena. What you waiting for, bud, said the usher, coming up to him. Don't you know we'll all get swept up with the trash and fed to the elephants if you wait too long? Probably he doesn't mean it, Oliver thought, but he got up hastily. At first he couldn't find his coat or cap, but then he remembered that he had left them in the seat from which Marlene had driven him. There they still were, luckily, though littered with peanut shells and a piece of chewed chewing gum, doubtless the work of the vindictive Marlene. Oliver cleaned them off as well as he could, put them on, and after quite a lot of blundering about in the wrong direction, owing to the fact that he didn't understand the meaning of the word exit, he found himself out on the street. Already it was dusk, and he began to hurry. For the first time, the probable consequences of his adventure began to trouble him. It made him especially uncomfortable to think of Cuffy for some reason. And now the streets kept turning out the wrong way, and he found himself on 10th Avenue instead of 5th, the place looked strange, full of high dark, dark buildings and big noisy boys who went bowling by him on roller skates and shouted at him hoarsely to get out of the way. As if that weren't enough, he began to have a terrible stomach ache. Though he was a calm and resourceful person, Oliver was only six years old after all. So the next move seemed to be to cry. 
He stumbled and banged along the street, sobbing quietly and wiping his nose on his sleeve, wishing with all his heart that he was home with Cuffy and that he had never heard of hot dogs or cotton candy. Dimly, he was aware of a clopping of hooves on pavement, but he was too miserable to look up until he heard a voice say, What's the matter, Sonny? Oliver saw a big square policeman seated on a big square horse, magnificent as anything at the circus. All his buttons and two gold teeth glittered richly in the light of the street lamp. What's eaten you? Replied, repeated, the com <laughs> repeated the policeman kindly. I'm lost, wept Oliver, and I'm sick at my stomach, and I want to go home. What's your name? Oliver M Melendi. Know where you live? Oliver told him. Okay, you quit crying now, said the policeman. You and me will take a little ride to your house. Think you can hold out? I guess so, replied Oliver dubiously. His stomach felt awfully unreliable. The policeman got off his horse and hoisted Oliver up on it as if he'd been a kitten. Then he got on himself behind Oliver, clucked at the horse, and away they went. Oliver thought gloomily that it was probably the only time in his whole life that he was ever going to ride with a mounted policeman, and he felt so sick that he couldn't appreciate it. I guess I'm going to get a scolding when I get home, officer told the policeman, or Oliver told the policeman. Maybe I'll get a spanking too. All the shine was gone off of the day. Why, what did you do? Will you promise not to arrest me? said Oliver cautiously. I doubt if it will be necessary, said the policeman. So Oliver told him. Well, I'll let your family take care of the penalty, the policeman decided. It's a very serious offense, all right, but it seems to me that you've been punished almost enough as it is. The traffic cop at Fifth Avenue looked at the mounted policeman and Oliver and said, you've run in another big time gang, oh, you've run in another big time gang leader, I see. You'd be surprised, replied Oliver's policeman and gave Oliver a pat on the shoulder. At the Melendy house, all was confusion. Randy was in tears. Father, who had returned from Philadelphia, and Rush were still out searching. And Cuffy was saying into the telephone, six years old, he has blue eyes, blonde hair, and he weighs, when the doorbell rang and she dropped the receiver. Oh, Oliver, darling, where were you? cried Mona's voice. And Cuffy arrived to see her on her knees beside Oliver, who looked smaller and paler than ever before. Beside him, behind him stood the largest, most solid policeman she had ever seen in her life. Aching with relief, Cuffy hugged Oliver, and then she looked up at the policeman and said, that's the quickest response I ever got from anything. I hadn't no more than just finished describing him to the police this minute. The police force is never at a loss, ma'am, replied the officer with a wink. Cuffy held Oliver away from her. Where in the world have you been? To the circus, replied Oliver wanely. To the circus? Alone? Cried, Cuff <laughs> cried Cuffy, horrified. It wouldn't, I wouldn't be too hard on him, ma'am, advised the officer. Go ahead and spank me if you want to, Oliver said. And he was sick on the doormat. Oof. Long, long afterward, with all the thunder and lightning in his stomach had subsided and the danger of a spanking was past, Oliver lay in his small bed with his hand in father's. Why did you go without telling us, though? asked Father. You could have gone to the circus. Rush or Cuffy would have been glad to take you. I would have taken you myself if I could have stolen the time. Oliver sighed. I did ask Cuffy about it once, but she said, Oh, no, there's much too measles around. There's too much measles around. And everybody else was going out alone on their Saturdays, so I just thought I'd go alone, too. I did want to see the circus so badly. Didn't you know we would worry? I guess I didn't think about it until afterward, Oliver admitted. Well, you will never scare us like that again, will you? No, I never will, if I can help it, promised Oliver. All right, then, that's that. Now, suppose you tell me what you liked best at the circus. Oh, everything was wonderful. I liked the man on the one-wheeled bicycle and the elephants and that automobile with all the clowns and the donkey in it and the lady who stood on her head on the swing and I liked all the things I was eating while I was eating them. But the thing I liked best of all wasn't in the circus. What was that, said father? It was when the policeman brought me home on the horse, replied Oliver. For now, no longer overshadowed by stomach aches or unhappy apprehensions, the memory of that ride had become a radiant thing. He remembered the horse's two pointed ears that could move independently of each other 
and its brawny arching neck with the tiny black, tidy black mane and its strong, healthy smell. It was sort of like riding on a boat, only better because it felt alive and you were higher up. And behind, immense and gorgeous in his uniform, rode the officer of the law who had befriended him. Oliver remembered how he had held the reins in white gloved hands, the size of baseball mitts. The splendor of that ride would never die. <laughs> well, that's the end of chapter five. So it was Oliver's Saturday. And boy, was his family worried about him, huh? All right, well, we will continue on with chapter six tomorrow. You guys have a great night.